This evening on The Rock Newman Show, as a way to get closer to Israel, the U.S. President has moved officially to recognize Jerusalem as its capital. It's a controversial decision that some say overlooks Israel's human rights abuses. We'll examine two situations in Israel that need a closer look. We'll talk to the father of Ahed Tamimi, a teen who along with 400 other Palestinian children is being held in an Israeli prison and will explore Israel's deportation of African immigrants. That's coming up right now on The Rock Newman Show. Welcome to The Rock Newman Show from the campus of historic Howard University located in the nation's capital. I'm Rock Newman and it is my desire to inspire you with personal stories of extraordinary achievement. The United States considers Israel an ally, but that shouldn't mean we turn a blind eye to everything that's happening there. Here to discuss the imprisonment of Palestinian children and the treatment of African immigrants are Ra'ed Jarrah, Advocacy Director for the Middle East and North Africa at Amnesty International USA, and Melvin Foote, CEO and founder of Constituency for Africa. Joining us on Skype is Basim Tamimi, Ahed's father. So, Mr. Tamimi, we want to go directly to you. Um, there is absolutely a tragic situation in your life and many would, would say in the in the lives of Palestinians in your neighboring community in your community and in your neighboring uh, community so your daughter is in prison as a father who is responsible for the well-being and the care and the support and the protection of a daughter how does this make you feel? It seems to be very much a personal human tragedy. It's hard and complicated uh, to be a father and a husband, your wife and your daughter in a prison in the hands of your enemy. And you feel scared, worry, and uh, uh, don't know what will happen in the near future. It's not clear what will happen, and I uh, feel sad for uh, uh, the situation they, that they live in. I sleep in, slept in her bed before uh, a week. I feel warm, but I know where she is sleeping. I know what is the situation she lives in and what the conditions that are surrounded her uh, and her mother. I am... Uh, also feel proud because every parents in the world would like their daughter to be strong uh, as Ahd and face uh, a ma an armed man by this way that she face the, uh, uh, the armed man in front of her, of her home to protect her family and to protect herself from this uh, soldier. Yes, I feel proud, I feel worried, it's complicated. But also, we haven't any choice. There is no safe place in Palestine, uh, and the enemy of uh, our humanity is the Israeli occupation, who uh, uh, control all the detail of our life. We can't uh, make any plan for the next future, as Ahd always say, I would like to be a football player, but the occupation destroyed my dream, and I now plan to study law to defend my issue and myself. Um, let me ask you, we saw footage of Ahed um, 
as she was confronting the Israeli soldiers. And the accusation is, is that she, she punched and kicked Israeli soldiers. I don't know exactly how tall she is or how much she raised, but she looks like a rather small child and whatever kicking was done or whatever slapping was done, it was like a tiny mosquito against a giant. What do you say is the reason that she is now in prison and your wife is imprisoned also? What do you think the reason, the, the re, I'm going to call the real reason. What do you think the real reason is? The real reason that the colonization, the Zionist colonization on our land uh, make a genocide and ethnic cleansing for the Palestinian. They target the Palestinian because they are just Palestinian. And for that, the big license the project started, it's a land without population. They want to push us out of our low land and our homes. Uh, for me, that uh, I think that who slapped the hands of, 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 of Ahd is the face of the soldier. I think uh, it's not common sense to talk about the, the, uh, that there is a, viol a violent more than the violent comes by the shape and the uniform of the soldier in front of the eyes of my children in front of my home. For that, I think they want to put Ahd in jail because their uh, public opinion start يعني, يعني angry because they saw their soldier, the, the main value of the Israeli society, its power. And for that, they no, don't want to see their, their soldier weak. They would like their soldier to appear killing and shooting children. And, but it's not يعني, a human feeling because the, يعني, the, the, the normal react for, for the, the normal society that they become angry when their soldier appear killing the children. But we don't know, we don't see any react when the uh, settler burned the Wabshi family when they're bed, or when the, they burn Abu Khdair in his way to school, or the soldier who shoot children every day. But they uh, become angry when they saw Ahd slap the, so the soldier. Nobody indicate in the Israeli media that Ahad slapped the soldier after 20 minutes he shot her, her, her cousin Muhammad Tamimi in his face and he become in a critical condition for 10 days and he have a surgery and he until now in the bad circumstances and uh, يعني, they arrest him uh, before two days yeah. uh, in this uh, hard condition and yeah. in his illness yeah. and they don't care or they for his situation. This means that the Israeli occupation target the Palestinian because they are Palestinian. They target the children to broke this generation yeah. who will be able to, to stand in front of the Israeli occupation all, by all its face, uh, settler or checkpoint or army. So, we will continue our, our, our method and our way and our struggle until we take took our freedom. So uh, my, my last question here, we so much thank you for joining us by Skype. But my last question would be this. I, I, I would make a couple comments and then ask a question. You refer very clearly, very directly to Israel as Israel as being your enemy. You uh, say that they are attempting to cleanse your community. I think another people would say ethnic cleansing. Um, so this has a, been an issue that has been going on as long as I think humans can remember. As a father whose wife and daughter is in jail, in an Israeli jail, do you see or have any hope at all for peace, for Israel and Palestinians to be able to live peacefully? Uh, yes, we don't struggle for a struggle. We struggle to take our goal that to end the occupation in our land and the colonization. For me, I, I fight for the two-state solution since long time in my life, and I had been in jail nine times in my life. I lost my sister, I lost my brother-in-law, 
my wife and my daughter in the, the jail. I, they arrested 20 persons from my family. They killed more than 22 persons uh, since 1967 occupation. But also I have a hope. I have a hope that peace will be finally become the solution of the situation after we can analyze and destroy the colonization mentality and the occupation way of dealing with the Palestinian. We, I now talk about my hope that to free our minds and our thought and our belief from all the, uh, the thought that don't accept each other and go step forward to, for the one state solution to be to, uh, to target the apartheid regime and to the colonization in our land until we reach the point and the period of time that we built a state of peace for everyone living in this land, despite his religion, his color, or his ethnicity. We believe in that the main uh, and the important part of the struggle is the human being. For that, we need to, to follow our humanity, to follow justice and peace and the freedom until we reach the, the goal that everyone live in this land in peace, to be uh, an example for the land of peace in the homeland of the prophet of peace. Mr. Basim Tamimi, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And now to you gentlemen, thank you for joining us here uh, today. Thanks for having um, us. Talking about a dynamic, talking about a situa situation, talking about here history, serious history. Um, I can't help but to think that there is a parallel that is taking place here now. Well, recently you had the shootings, the terrorist shooting in Florida, and you have high school students who are becoming the symbol to resistance to the terror of guns. And in Israel now, in prison, you have children who are becoming a worldwide symbol to the resistance of the occupation and the treatment of what is a dual justice system, what is called and seem to be demonstrated a dual justice system in Israel. First, I would like to ask you, Riot, if you can give us your interpretation of why Ahed Tamimi and so many other children are in Israeli prisons. And I'd like to make the distinction between that there are two systems of justice in Israel, if you could illuminate the point. Yeah, um, Amnesty International uh, has been highlighting the case of Ahed al-Tamimi for a number of reasons. Of course, the, number, the first reason is her individual case. So we are extremely concerned that this child, a 16-year-old child that was arrested, uh, is being mistreated by the Israeli authorities. Uh, Israel is uh, treating her in a way that constitutes a blatant violation to Israel's um, uh, requirements to, uh, under international law. Mm -hmm. um, How so? Well, under the conventions that Israel is uh, abided by. Um, Supposed like to abide by. This, for example, the UN Convention on the Right of Child. Uh, yeah. Israel is a state party to that convention. So Israel actually joined that, opted in to that convention. Mm -hmm. And that convention requires states such as Israel to um, minimize the number, the, the time of imprisonment of children uh, and use it as a last resort. Mm -hmm. In the case of Ahed Tamimi, um, the imprisonment is used as a punishment, as a disproportionate punishment to this child. Uh, she's been there for months now with no charges, uh, and her trial date keeps on being pushed away. So that's that's the number number one. Say, you, the you, issue of the individual yeah. is number one. You, you say that no, no charges. Uh, their information is that she is, is that she has been charged mm -hmm. with assaulting uh, their Israeli soldiers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, 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 she hasn't been confronted so far. We haven't had an actual um, hearing day to see her uh, uh -huh. defenses. You're right, that we, I've read about seven charges so far uh, yeah. regarding the attack on the soldier. Um, 
and other uh, charges regarding things that she did in the past, in the last mm -hmm. couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, other encounters with soldiers. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, the other level why we're engaged is that her case is also an emblematic case for Palestinian children in Israeli prisons. Mm -hmm. So Israel every year arrests around 700 children uh, and tries them through military courts. Uh, the UNICEF, for example, uh, the United Nations uh, agency that works on children, UNICEF, yeah. Uh, they describe the system as unjust. Uh, it's uh, unparalleled in any other place around the world mm -hmm. that there is a juvenile uh, uh, military court system that is meant to deal with uh, Palestinian children. It's very separate than how Israeli children are being treated. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's w you know, the other case. And the third one and the last one is that she's also a symbol of her own community, yeah. the village of Nabi Saleh. It's yeah. a village of 600 people yeah. who have been um, uh, using nonviolent uh, tools to protest uh, what they see as injustice uh, coming from the Israeli side. So unfortunately, it's also you know, an example of this breakdown uh, or, or a crackdown on the civil society that we have no witnessed in the last few years. There is a crackdown coming from the Israeli side and from the Palestinian Authority, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases against the same activists, uh, it's a shrinking space of civil society. Okay, so man, we are here sitting at this table today uh, dealing with some, some severe challenges to peace to justice. And Melfoot, I turn to you as the, the founder and the leader of an organization that is a, a CFA, con, a Constituency for Africa. And one of the issues within the uh, Israeli sphere now has been what many are characterizing as a terribly unjust immigration practice and deportation practice by the Israelis of Africans. You are, uh, again, an organization, Constituency for Africans. I'd like for you to share with us your thoughts about those dynamics and circumstances. Well, I think, uh, no question, globally something is going on. Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, I wouldn't say only Israel. I mean, I'm seeing this France, I'm seeing Great Britain, I'm seeing Canada, I'm seeing the United States. Uh, it seemed to me that um, the, the youth bulge is happening. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, the young people, the demographics are changing. In some of these countries in Africa, the population are 40, 50 percent under 25 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, where are the jobs? Where are the educational opportunities? Right. Where are the opportunities for, for these young people? So they, they feel a sense of hope. Uh, hopelessness. Yeah. So they're running off, they're getting on boats, they're going to Libya, they're being sold as slaves, they're doing all kinds of things are happening to the young people yeah. and some of them are in Israel. Yeah. And so I think that the world is changing demographically. I think climate change is a factor. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that's bigger than any one country. I think it's global. Yeah. So are you, so you're concerned about the globe and, 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 and what is happening with Africans throughout the diaspora. Yeah. When it comes to what is happening, have you examined what is happening to the deportation of the Africans, specifically talking about Israel? Well, I, I have. I've talked to uh, uh, some of them. I've, uh, I read, of course, and I monitor the situation. Uh, it's bad, you know, and uh, you now have a population of Africans from Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Somalia, mm -hmm. uh, they're flocking there. And so the population, oh, wow, what are we going to do with these people? They've yeah. identified them as blacks. Yeah. They've identified them as stateless. They've identified them in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, uh, it, it's very shocking. Do you characterize that as um, racism when it is related to their immigration policies? Uh, it's absolutely a racist element to it. But I think it's also economics. Mm -hmm. I think it's also mm -hmm. political. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of factors there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it just straight up, these are blacks that deal with the blacks. I think these are a population that they feel threatened by for whatever reason. Yeah. And uh, they're being approached uh, systematically uh, because uh, race, because of culture. Riot? I think it's racism. Uh, unfortunately, there are reports coming from inside Israel 
that uh, shows very systemic racism mm -hmm. using language to, by the state to describe these uh, African migrants uh, as criminals, as infiltrators. Mm -hmm. Some officials in the um, centers that were set up by the state to process these migrants refer to these migrants as monkeys. Uh, and this became a, a, you know, a, a very controversial issue in Israel in the last few months. Mm -hmm. Definitely there is racism. Uh, Amnesty International has criticized what we see as a dysfunctional system in Israel when it, ke when it comes to dealing with asylum mm -hmm. seekers and refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, there are somewhere between 60 and 80,000 refugees, mostly uh, from Sudan and uh, Eritrea. Uh, so just to show you how dysfunctional the system is, um, it took them years until the Israeli state allowed them to petition the state for asylums. It mm -hmm. took them years. Mm. So out of the 50 or 60,000 who might be eligible, uh, around 30,000 were able to fill that form. Mm -hmm. Out of this 30,000 that filled the, filled the form, 15,000 forms were read and processed. Out of the 15,000 forms, 10 cases were accepted. Wow. So, you know, when you look at other countries around the world, the yeah. acceptance rate for Eritreans, for yeah. example, yeah. is around 90% for yeah. refugee asylum, yeah. uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And yeah. Israel is around 0.0001%. Wow. So it's, it's a dysfunctional system there. Yeah. Also, the fact that Israel is deporting tens of thousands of these uh, asylum seekers and refugees to Africa, not to their yeah. countries of origin, mostly to uh, Rwanda. Right. Uh, it's very uh, concerning because there is no system to receive them there. Yeah. Many of them end up being uh, victims of trafficking. Yeah. Uh, many of them are sent back home to countries that might torture them or put them in prison uh, because they left in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's an extremely messy situation. Mm -hmm. um, it might come, uh, you know, from a uh, racist reason, it might come from national security, whatever the intentions are. Yeah. This is a, 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 race, a, a situation that is a huge mess. Mm -hmm. It's not being dealt with uh, the right way by Israel. Mm -hmm. And I think the US government can play a very constructive role by pressuring the Israeli government to do so. I actually want to tell you one last thing. This week, uh, it came to my attention that there is a letter that is being sent by Congress by the Congressional Black Caucus mm -hmm. to the Israeli Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. The letter is not public yet. Yeah. It's still a draft letter. But, the, but I, I read the, the, the draft of the letter, and the letter tells the, the Israeli Prime Minister that this is wrong. Yeah. What's going on with uh, African migrants in Israel is wrong. Mm -hmm. This is unprecedented. This mm -hmm. is the first time ever that the Congressional Black Caucus yeah. sends a letter to Israel expressing these concerns. Yeah. So look, we cannot help, I think, but to draw a parallel between the leadership style, the imagery and the language, and more importantly, the policies being promulgated by the president here in the United States now, Donald Trump, and how they, how they, how they line up with if you will, the policies of Benjamin Netanyahu. How much of what is being experienced, what you just described, do you ascribe as a responsibility of Netanyahu? I share your view. Uh, the, the US uh, administration has been sending the wrong message to the world, uh, to the Middle East in particular, that the U.S. will not pay any attention to human rights violations. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, ironically, the case of Ahed al-Tamimi that we discussed earlier, yeah. if you read what happened earlier that day, yeah. she was out protesting President Trump's decision to move the embassy to uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem yeah. which is a decision that Amnesty International has criticized as well. Mm -hmm. It is a violation of international law. Mm -hmm. Uh, so she was out there protesting the decision, and uh, you know her her cousin was injured in that yeah. uh, um, in that protest. Shot in the face with shot in the face with the with, the, with a bullet. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so when you look at the the actual roots for what happened, yeah. it, the Trump administration definitely also um, bears responsibility for why that happened, mm -hmm. and the fact that the Israeli government and many other governments in the region mm. feel you know, that they can do whatever. They have a blank check mm -hmm. that they will get U.S. support, U.S. military aid, U.S. weapons, 
regardless of their actions, whether mm -hmm. it's Israel or Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or mm -hmm. Egypt. Mm -hmm. We have seen a rise in violations of human rights in the mm -hmm. last year mm -hmm. because President Trump has sent that message to them. Do whatever you want. We will continue to support you. Mel Foote, let me turn back to you because you said something um, earlier. Um, you almost matter-of-factly as an observation, uh, but that uh, an explosive subject. Um, I guess it maybe was six weeks, a couple of months ago. I saw footage uh, that made its rounds on the uh, in social media of the um, of of slaves being bought and sold in Libya. You just mentioned uh, Africans in Libya uh, being sold into slavery. Can you talk to us about what your organization has been able to observe and to find out, and again, uh, help us understand what is going on, what is going on there? Yeah, uh, one thing I want to say about the, uh, the Israeli situation, when I look at the, from the U.S. vantage point, it's like the skillet calling the, the kettle black. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> uh, how are we gonna tell Israel how to treat blacks in Israel when we treat blacks over here mm. so badly and yeah. humanely? Yeah. Uh, the slavery issue um, is complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, to say the least. Mm -hmm. uh, I think part of the problem is uh, the Europeans started to block Africans from accessing Europe. And okay. so the ideal being they paid actually uh, militia in Libya to you know, keep these people from reaching our shores. Uh -huh. And so that led, led for a backlog, a lot of young Africans uh, there. And what happened to you? Prostitution, uh, gangs, yeah. slavery, uh, all kinds of things happened to so, 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 so let me just ask you, so is it your position as an authority and, and a longtime uh, observer and vi having visited the continent in numerous times that actual slavery is taking place by p humans are being yeah. bought and sold in Libya? I think that's uh, absolutely what's happening. But I think there's a lot of other aspects to it. I think that a lot of the African governments are not doing what they should be doing to build their countries, to build the economies, to build... Mm -hmm create environment, enabling environments in their country so that people don't want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you got a lot of young people in some of these countries are just saying, there's nothing for me here, you know, what to lose, and they go take this risk crossing the Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it, it's, it's more complicated than just like what we faced in the south of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that same level, but exploitation, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, slavery, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, prostitution, absolutely, uh, yeah. name it, it's going on. So yeah. you, uh, you, 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 not just Middle East, you're, you work uh, uh, on, on Northern uh, Africa also, your thoughts? Well, Amnesty International operates all around the globe. And yeah, no, I'm talking about, you, you know, sort of your particular discipline, you it is included, you're under your purview is North Africa. Yes, my yeah. personal uh, uh, profile also covers North Africa. Uh -huh. uh, we actually documented these cases of slavery uh, and, and it was also documented and proved by a video that CNN obtained uh, and uh, broadcasted a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are definitely cases, instances mm -hmm. of selling humans in, uh, in Libya, se selling African migrants. Uh, there are many camps that we have uh, documented and confirmed where uh, African migrants uh, have been kept in miserable conditions. Uh, now, speaking about parallels with the U.S., another case that I, we talked about earlier today uh, before the beginning of the show uh, was something that also shocked me uh, in Algeria, which is another North African country. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like last year uh, there were uh, guidelines issued by the Algerian government to ban black people from using public transportation. And the rationale behind Did that. Did you say it seems like that? Or we, we, that we confirmed that. Now, the, the, so you, the you guidelines. Confirm you've do, there's documentation. Definitely. Confirmation of that. Yes. And the, the guidelines have been um, canceled towards the end of the year. But we have uh, information about those guidelines affecting private companies that are still following them, even after their official um, removal. Now, the rationale behind the guidelines was that there are many uh, illegal migrants or, you know, coming across uh, the border and they're using uh, public transportation to go around the country. Mm -hmm. Now, of, of course, for us as U.S. audiences, this yeah. issue of banning yeah. 
someone who's black yeah. from using public transportation is uh -huh. really shocking. Yeah. It's something that you would think it stopped happening half a century ago. Yeah. Well, it was happening in Algeria just a few months ago. Uh -huh. So unfortunately, there are violations in the entire region. And we, you know, many organizations, including Amnesty International, are following them. We're pressuring those governments yeah. to cancel these policies that are racist, that are discriminatory. But the, ent the entire situation is deteriorating. And I can only imagine that those who, again, put forth a recent policy to say they are banning blacks, when they hear the talk that comes from yeah, our yeah, leadership yeah. that says ban Muslims mm. and don't allow people in from those S-hole countries, mm. they feel a certain license to be able to act in that manner. Absolutely. So, Mel, Here's something that I'd like to see if maybe, again, both of you take a stab on. There was a point when it appeared as if Israel had extended an invitation and a welcome mat to Ethiopian Jews to come in, and that, or Ethiopians that to come in, they were going to um, uh, uh, put them in the use mini for the military. It appears as, what's the status of that now? Because se things seem to have again changed. Well, it started, uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer at the time in Ethiopia and Eritrea, so I uh -huh. was an eyewitness to it. Uh, at the time it was, oh, these are Jews, all Jews are welcome, and uh -huh. including the black Jews from Africa. Uh -huh. But it's changed uh, yeah. for whatever reason. I think of the economics, a, a lot of it, you know, uh, and if uh, we're competing for economics, I'm gonna find some way that I'm included and you're not. And yeah. Uh, it was easy to, to point the finger at the Africans here or there. So I think they don't uh, walk back on admitting African Jews uh, to Israel as they did 20, mm. 30 years ago. I mean, I would say, you know, this is an issue that Amnesty International has also followed. So in addition to the discrimination against African migrants who are refugees seeking asylum, there seems to be another level of discrimination inside Israel for those who are Israeli citizens who are Jewish, but happen to be of um, African descent. Uh, so th uh, there is, it seems like many of them yeah. uh, have been treated by second, as cl second class citizens. Uh, there are layers and layers of discrimination uh, in Israel and Palestine. Uh, when you look at the, uh, you know, the, the larger picture, you know, you have Israelis and there are Palestinians and Palestinians at large are, are treated as second to, to Israelis. But when you, when you look at the Israeli society itself, there are uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel, 20% of the population uh, happen to be uh, Palestinians who have Israeli citizenships. And yeah. they are also discriminated against. There are um, Israeli Jews of African descent who are discriminated against. So there are levels and levels of discrimination there. So I, I wanna, uh, I, I, knowing that I was gonna have you on, I, I really wanted to ask you the question, Ryan. Uh, to share something and then to ask you to respond. A couple of years ago, I was uh, speaking with a highly esteemed Egyptian scholar professor. He maintained that the formation of Israel was a construct of the United States government putting a power in place that would help control the actions and the behavior of the surrounding countries in the Middle East and to be a mischief maker. Now, it's the first time I'd heard it described that way. That obviously is, would be met with consternation and called a quite the controversial uh, comment. I'd like to get your thoughts on that comment and to talk a little bit about the history and uh, of the formation of Israel as a state. I've heard many narratives. Uh, some of them seem to have uh, some backing through history. Some of them have, uh, honestly, anti-Semitic undertones. Um, there are different narratives about Israel inside Israel, and there are different narratives about Israel and Palestine. If you ask Palestinians or Arabs or uh, Muslims, um, 
I mean, the fact that May 15th is celebrated on one side of the wall and is called the Nakba, the catastrophe on the other side of the wall, gives you this impression that there are multiple narratives there. Um, I mean, I don't think... Rather, th rather conflicting. Very conflicting. <laughs> right. uh, I think, like, some of these um, um, narratives have implications on international law. Like, for example, what happened in 48 versus what happened in 1967. Mm -hmm. uh, Amnesty International, for example, has a very strong uh, line in drawing that, uh, you know, line in the sand around 1967. Mm -hmm. So any land that was acquired after 1967 does not belong to Israel. It's occupied land. Mm -hmm. It's a violation of international law to annex that land, to move one's population into that, that land, mm -hmm. to move someone's embassy into that land. Mm -hmm. These are actually acts that might amount to a war crime mm -hmm. under some of the Geneva Conventions. Mm -hmm. So you see, like some of the narratives uh, of history don't really have that much impact on international law. Mm -hmm. If an Israeli comes and says, all of this land is ours because it's some document says that, mm -hmm would say, you know, it doesn't matter really what narrative you're um, ascribing to, yeah. because there is international law with that. Right. Some other narratives, I think, no, no human rights organization will get into <laughs> a debate about uh, like religious uh, uh, analysis or understandings of um, the right of Israel or the right of Palestine. or like These are things that co are completely fall under the, the preview of someone like Amnesty. Mm -hmm. Mel, l let me... Um let me have you to speak on uh, the matter. Again, constituency for Africa form. Tell us what, uh, what's your mission? The mission of the CFA is to educate the public about Africa, to improve cooperation and coordination among all the groups who work on African issues. And we work to shape U.S. policy toward Africa. And the premise being, if you look at U.S. policy toward Africa historically, at one point, our policy was to drop food from an airplane and, you know, hopefully somebody uh, could benefit from it. Mm -hmm. We killed more people with those pallets falling from the air than we helped them, probably. Yeah. Then there was a policy of giving the money to the, to, to the African government, the new governments that were emerging. Yeah. And so we gave the money to these African leaders that we put in place. What happened to that money went straight to their pocket and mm -hmm. straight to their bank account. And, you know, we know what happened to that. Then we gave it to the NGOs. Sands benefit to the population. That's it. Yeah. We gave it to the NGOs. We brought in care and saved the children. And they started having conferences and flying all over the place. Very little of the money uh, ended up on the ground in Africa. It bought U.S. products. It, you know, it ended up bank accounts over here. Uh, we are now shifting. I mean, U.S. policy has always been faulty at best. Mm -hmm. So we tried to address that. We tried to address it by educating our base. Mm -hmm. Most Americans are uninformed, yeah. underinformed, or misinformed yeah. about Africa. Yeah. When I first went to Africa in 73, you, know, you couldn't Google anything. Yeah. I learned as a Peace Corps volunteer I was going to Ethiopia. Yeah. I thought Ethiopia was in the Middle East yeah. because of the Bible story, Bethlehem, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah. It wasn't until I went to the library and found a map that well, Ethiopia was in the heart of Africa that I knew. Yeah. But uh, I, I went to Africa thinking that Tarzan would be at that airport sure. when we arrived, right. you know, because of the story we had of yeah. You know, and so CFA tried to uh, correct those distortions. We tried to work uh, across party lines. I work with Democrats, Republicans. It's not about party. It's about Africa. Uh -huh. I work with uh, blacks. I work with whites. I work with whoever. But our mission is really to, to galvanize the African uh, diaspora, African-American community. But we work with anybody who wants to work in support of Africa. Yeah. You know, in 2009, I was in Libya. And something that struck me was the incredible presence of the Chinese yeah. in terms of what they were doing in Libya at the time. Now, nine, that's, that's, that's now nine years ago. As a world power, the initiative of the Chinese government and of business folks in Chinese is seems to be unquestionably highly focused on Africa. Some say very wisely so. It seems as if what they're doing as a world power is developing a relationship that creates a structure that seriously advances their interest as a world power because 
There are no greater resources than the underground resources that are on the continent of Africa. And it seems as if the United States policy lags way far behind the Chinese. Is that correct? Absolutely. And um, absolutely. And the Chinese uh, are operating a China paradigm. They're actually working in their own interest. No question about that. Uh, um, the U.S. is now yeah. trying to figure out how we catch up. Mm -hmm. I'm involved in some of those discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that uh, we, we made a, uh, I think the U.S. is the best chance of catching up with China is to engage the diaspora. Mm -hmm. By and large, the U.S. did not want Africans to meet African Americans in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. They thought the Africans would be talking about socialism and, mm -hmm. and they didn't want it to be polluted with Stokely Carmichael and mm -hmm the black power movement over here. Mm -hmm. So they try to keep them away. When the Africans came over here to educate them, they put them in Minnesota, they put them in North Dakota, they put yeah. them in New Hampshire, yeah. put them as far away from Rock Newman as they could. <laughs> uh, but uh, now we try to figure out, okay, we're gonna have a good relationship with Africa. We really do need to have the African diaspora over here strongly linked up with the African continent, uh, sharing technology, sharing policy, sharing yeah. uh, what have you. So. There's some thinking that's going on right now about how do we go about engaging the diaspora and what is the role of the United States in the process? Ryan, when I uh, uh, started to deal with I had Tamimi and do some research on, you know, her arrest, her continued imprisonment, and only realized in doing that that there was what, again, is referred to as a dual system of justice mm -hmm. in Israel. It made me think about when I visited apartheid uh -huh. South Africa mm -hmm. and the kind, some of the kinds of abuses that I, that I was able to see personally and of course that are, that have been long, you know, was long reported with, with apartheid. I mean, pure, uh, unadulterated, state-sponsored discrimination, violence, terrorism, and the rest. Some folks today characterize the dynamics in Israel as a form of apartheid. Mm -hmm. And you say what? Well, Amnesty International has heard many of these observations from our members, from you know, people who traveled around that nation. Um, I've actually um, heard many other details, like for example, there are two different uh, road systems, street systems, one mm -hmm. for Israelis mm -hmm. and one for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two different water systems, mm -hmm. one for Israelis and one for Palestinians. Yeah. There, there are two different judicial systems. <sighs> so I've heard many of these things. Now, Amnesty International has historically did not use the apartheid word, we call it the A word, you know, like we've never used yeah. the apartheid yeah. word in the past. We just adopted a new policy a couple of years ago uh. that we should start looking into some situations around the world yeah. and examine them if they would fit the description of apartheid. Apartheid mm. is a big, big crime against humanity. Yeah. So this year uh, and last year, we're, uh, we're starting to look into some situations, um, I think in November of 2017, uh, it's the first time in our history that we use the word apartheid to describe a country, and it was uh, Myanmar. So the situation with the Rohingya Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, our researchers traveled there, you know, they followed a very complex criteria, and we came up with a determination mm -hmm. that the situation in uh, Myanmar or Burma mm -hmm. counts as apartheid. Mm -hmm. uh, I know as a fact that we are looking into Israel and Palestine as another case that we're examining now. Yeah. We're looking at all of these merits, some stuff that you mentioned now, yeah. other observations that our researchers are looking into. We might make a determination about that soon. Uh, did, uh, so you're gonna, you're gonna make a determination as to whether or not Amnesty International is going to call it apartheid. Yes, and if that is the case, I think that is a very serious violation. Uh, we don't take it very easily. You, yeah. you know, this is a, a, a crime yeah. against humanity.